we, we start uh, uh, with questions to Professor Körner, then we shift over to Petteri and then we mix. So, questions on the tree line and related issues to Dr. Körner. Yes, please, Peter. A microphone. Maybe we need a microphone for you. Right. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting uh, presentation. Uh, a short question about the global tree mass. Now we saw the boreal forests, but thinking about the tropical forests, where I think uh, the trees may not adapt that easily. So, so how would the global tree mass uh, increase or decrease? What what would be the trend with uh, the global change and tree mass? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned mass. So this is the pool, the size of the carbon stock. And there's so much confusion about that issue. Uh, I had not the time, but maybe now I can re-emphasize. If a tree grows faster and a tree gains space at the loss of others, and eventually the tree is dying. And what all what we know is that faster growing trees die earlier. So if you have faster growth, that what we call the turnover gets bigger. But the stock may actually go down. For instance, the most productive uh, forest systems are plantations. And plantations have a rotation time here in Finland, maybe 50 years, the fastest one, but in some tropical countries, five years and six years. So they rotate. They, they yield a lot of pulp or of timber that can be used instead of forest, but the stock is very low. And usually, even in the Amazonian basis, the slowest growing part, slowing gro slowest growing part of Amazonia has the highest stock. So there is quite often a negative trade-off between growth rate and stock, between cash flow or turnover of money and capital. That's an analogy. So it's, it's, a, it's a big mistake. And even if we see today some ramping up synchronously over the, over the globe in forest biomass, we are pushing a wave of mortality ahead of us. So we are synchronizing that slope. And then in 50 or 100 years, these trees will fall and the carbon will be released. So my main message is don't confuse anything that relates to growth rate with storage. Okay. Other questions? Yes, please. Let me carry the microphone. Thank you, Lisa Velika Gansalto University. This may be a little strange question, but are there any um, lobbying organizations for trees? Who would you sort of go and uh, harness to help not just only us to understand the interests, but who would sort of support the rights of trees on this earth? Thanks. I, I think I understand what you mean. Protecting forests is really one of the most efficient ways to keep carbon in biomass rather than returning it to the atmosphere. But there is a global demand in fi fiber and timber and pulp. And so there's a conf conflict. If we want to have more fiber, more timber, then the forest uh, gets more f rotating faster and the stock goes down or the area shrinks. So if the Kyoto Protocol would use the right incentive, it would not pay for replanting, but it would pay for not cutting. But that's an economic problem. How are you giving somebody money for doing nothing? <laughs> uh, so that's why the Kyoto Protocol is still better than nothing, but it gives an incentive to something that will pay back adapts in 200 years. It takes 200 years for a tropical forest to re-establish its former stock. So as long as the ramp goes up, we are still in a deficit. So protecting old growth forests would be a major, uh, major task. Christian Breyer, Lappenrante University of Technology. I would like to continue the question. So let's assume we have stopped cutting down forests and let's assume we have a lot of nutrients because that we need for growth we would have a lot of water and we would take huge areas uh, which had been formerly covered by forests maybe even others we know Sahara had been former times a rainforest region uh, how fast that could be grown 
and on what stock we are talking. How many hundreds or thousands of gigatons of CO2 could be stored in what period of time in such, let's, let's call it a huge global afforestation, reforestation program? I cannot give you a number. But we know that humanity has removed roughly 50% of the forests that were there before humans became agriculturalists. So the world could carry twice as much forest as we still have. So if you take the biomass of the current forest and expand it to that area, it's about twice as what we have. That's a, a rule of thumb calculation. However, where had the forest been removed? It had re been removed in areas where we produce food. Mm -hmm. So whenever you undertake such an effort, you are in conflict with food production. And it's not just uh, arable land, it's not just cropping um, uh, corn and soybean, but it's 50% it's, uh, of the global surface is grazed. 50% of the Earth's surface that contains any vegetation is grazed. And much of that land uh, is not useful for, for tillage. So you could part of that return to forest, but then you wouldn't graze there. My intention was to go for areas where we are not in conflict. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but humans were clever enough to cut the forest where there's a forest. And where there's no forest, you cannot cut it. And the Sahara had no forest and has no forest. So there's no way to reforest the Sahara. You can only reforest areas that had been cut by intention. What was the intention? To produce food and graze. So you, you cannot escape that conflict. There's very little land area that could be reforested that is not under any current use from which local people uh, take food. It's very small, a very small area. In, to cut a long story short, I'm, a, as a biologist, against being misused for green solutions to the CO2 problem. It's more symbolic. It's not really a solution. There's no green solution. There should be a ban on diesel from crops. So biological oil production should be banned because you can only produce either diesel oil or food. And if Germany or whatever country in Europe is now producing rape oil for diesel, then the food comes from Argentina and Brazil and the forest is cut. So taking arable land for fossil fuel replacement products is a no-go. So there is no free lunch in Yes, that no free lunch. Free lunch. Before I give the mic to you, uh, just coming back to Sahara, uh, just this morning in the major newspaper Helsing in Sanomat here, we had a big article talking about forestation of desert areas. And there's this Yatir project in Israel, uh, there's the, this Morocco project. And how does this go together with what you said, what the trees require, cli nutrients, CO2, etc. So what about this? Yeah, I know the Yatir forest. I mean, as a rule of thumb, you need 250 millimeters of precipitation to grow some tree cover. Mm. Not really forest that you have here, mm. some. That is shrubby trees, small trees. The biomass storage is minute. You can, in Afghanistan, in some marginal areas of the Sahel, you can grow some shrubby trees, some small trees, but ultimately you're, you're confined to areas with more than 250 millimeters of rainfall. And that's an extremely challenging limit. I would rather say 300, 400 millimeters, mm -hmm. and in cool areas, 250 millimeters. But there's an absolute limit in terms of what that you need to grow trees. The Finnish Meteorological Institute is uh, collaborating there. But let's give the mic to the next uh, Question. Thank you, Timo Heikko, professional forester. We had no Arctic vulture in the early 1980s, but first, vielen Dank für die wunderbare Vorlesung. <laughs> um, what about Mutter Erde? We said 1980s, Mutter Erde is kaput. You know, uh, the Saurus Regen. And, and if you look at uh, the carbon uh, and other gas exchanges and the, the storage, of grazing, agriculture, or forest land, what's going to happen? I, I think uh, if we learn one thing from the forest decline era in the 1970s and 80s when I was a young postdoc is 
Uh, we need to be very realistic with our prediction. The problem was in those days we had to overdo it to get some funding. And now people believe because the forests recovered, because we, co we, we solved the SO2 problem, there is no problem in the forest. But we still have acid rain because the nitrogen oxide that you mentioned dissolves in water and becomes acidity. So unbuffered soils are still under an impact, not as bad as it was in the 1970s, under impact of acidification not just the ocean. So the problem is not over. And you remember, the forest decline started in 1976. 1976, together with 1947, I believe, or 45, were the, the major drought periods that Europe has ever seen. 76 was an absolute disaster. And drying means no nutrients. A dry soil is uh, providing no nutrients because nutrients need a moist soil. So if the soil dries, the trees may not suffer from water shortage because they have a few deep roots to stay, stay alive, but they have no access to nutrients. And when the soil was as, as acidified as in the 1970s, then this combination of no nutrients, acidity and drought started the problem. Yeah, but uh, what is the role of uh, treating soil, opening up forest, thinning? What happens to the uh, emission coming from the soil? Ah, uh, you mean uh, a loss so of a, a loss of car a loss of soil carbon? Yes. Okay, so, so I did not talk about soils today, because that would be a completely different lecture. But. Forest. Then I give a forest microphone. <laughs> so, 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 soils, soils in general, there is more carbon in grassland soils than in forest soils per unit area. But you're right, uh, the same amount of carbon that is in trees is in the humus of forest soils. And in grassland, it's more than that. But forest soils are very uh, recalcitrant, they don't turn over fast. And it's, so it's very difficult to bring them up but it's also difficult, but less so, to reduce them. Misuse of, um, of land causes erosion and breakdown and permafrost uh, is a loss of soil carbon. But it's three times more carbon in the soils than in biomass. So uh, the, the soil issue is something we cannot solve here. It's too complicated, too big, but the only thing I can say, fortunately, soils are slow in any direction. But the soils are not solving the problem of the atmosphere. You cannot store carbon in the soil without taking nutrients away from the trees. That's something that everybody should have in mind going home. You cannot put carbon into the soil without fixing, locking away from the life cycle phosphorus, nitrogen and everything else. Because soils don't store diamonds or sloot or whatever, graphite, they store organic matter. And the ratio between nitrogen and carbon is the worst in soil. It's only 1 to 12, while in a tree trunk it's 1 to 400. So if you want to store carbon in the soil, you take away food from the plants and you slow uh, growth. You can sugar forest soils or put sawdust on the forest and the trees will, sl will slow growing. So nobody should hope that we solve our problem by putting more carbon to soils. There's one exception, which is charcoal. Mm -hmm. But that's a small, a small technological way in, in agricultural fields. But Soil carbon storage is no solution. It will take a, a, away vigor from tree growth because it locks off nutrients. So we will uh, uh, perhaps uh, change to, to Petteri's topic. But before that, is there a difference between, uh, between forests with high, a high level of biodiversity versus very low level of biodiversity? Yes. Yes, the tropical forest is the most diverse and stocks more per unit area than a boreal forest in Finland. Mm. And it, people have shown that if you have a monoculture or you have only two species, the two species have a bigger stock because there's complementarity. They use different root depths. They use nutrients a little bit different. So two can combine their demands in a way that there's a slight a slight increase in productivity. Mm -hmm. So this is even discussed in crop production now that a mixture of cereals mm -hmm. produces more yield mm -hmm. given 
they have to, to, to grow synchronously because you have to harvest at one time. But people found out the super yield can be produced by mixing cereals, uh, cultivars, and not growing the super single cultivar that is the world record production. So you can take moderate ones and mix them and you get a higher yield. It's this synergy, synergy complementarity. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Very interesting. So that would be another long lecture. I'm sorry. I have <laughs> so, uh, what about questions to Professor Talas? Yes, please. Thank you, Petteri. And I would like to ask the impacts in our uh, neighboring country, Russia. You, you're very referring the impacts in Europe and, and Finland. So, uh, as you said, so the temperature increase is double in the Arctic areas. And uh, now we have already some two degrees warming. Uh, what is the situation in the permafrost in, in Russia? Has it started already? And, and what are the, the future prognosis? Yeah, so, so we have seen uh, warming also in the, in the soils. And, and, and there are some measurements from the Arctic showing that uh, this warming is seen uh, down to 60 meters uh, be below the uh, be below the Earth's surface, and um, and and, and uh, of course the concern is what's going to happen to the methane and the carbon dioxide that is stored in the in the permafrost. And uh, and and Finland has uh, established uh, when I was running the Met service in Finland, we established. Uh, uh, our own station to Pallas in, in northern Finland, and, and then we established also two stations to Russia. One uh, to Tixi, which is uh, where the Lena River meets the Arctic uh, Ocean, and, uh, and, and the other one on I island uh, Bolshevik, uh, close to the North, uh, North Pole. And, uh, and there are also other methane stations in the, in the Arctic, and so far we haven't seen any, any major outbreak of, uh, of, of methane because of the permafrost. Uh, Melting, but this is clearly one thing that we have to follow. So that's uh, that's a that's a certain risk for the future, and uh, and as compared to carbon dioxide, the lifetime of methane is only 12 years. So that's the good side. Of course, if we have a long-lasting outbreak of uh, methane for for 200 years, that's uh, that's a different story. But basically, this problem is uh, is a little bit different magnitude as compared to the carbon dioxide uh, problem. Then we have also some some of uh, of methane stored in the uh, in, in the ocean uh, bedrocks and, and and what's going to happen with that uh, methane that's that's also one of the interesting uh, features to be to be followed. And so far, the methane trend uh, has been following the global trend, and, uh, and 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 so far the biggest impacts has been uh, coming from from the from the uh, methane released from the tropical tropical zones. Uh, rather than from the Arctic. But that's, that's one of the matters of uh, concern for the future. So, so as I said, if we reach uh, globally two degrees, it would mean more than four degrees uh, in, in Arctic uh, average and, and, and in winter time even even more, so that's that's for sure certain certain thing to be to, to be followed. But so far, we haven't seen major outbreak, and we actually expected to see something already now. And so, so let's see how it, how it goes in the future. Thank you. So my question is about political will and sort of negotiation ability beyond the sort of multi-country. Kyoto Paris negotiations. For instance, there is the big, big global initiative by China called Road and Belt, or is it Belt and Road? Do you see any climate related components in there? Or do you see any other of these kind of global initiatives that could actually include these type of considerations? Thank you. Yeah, so as, 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 as I was showing, we haven't seen major improvement in the, in the emission uh, scene so far. And, and, and that's, that, that's a major concern for, for me personally, and, uh, and that's also a major concern for the, uh, my colleague, uh, Secretary General Guterres. And that's why he's going to host the climate uh, summit uh, for the heads of state uh, September this year. And, and the basic idea behind that summit is to give a boost, uh, boost to uh, Paris uh, Agreement implementation and initiate some new, new ideas how to, how to proceed. 
And the basic uh, challenge is uh, how quickly we are going to get uh, rid of uh, fossil fuel based uh, based power plants, uh, how quickly we are going to get rid uh, from uh, from uh, fossil fuel fueled uh, vehicles and uh, and and so forth. And uh, and that's also a challenge in countries like China, which has just built uh, plenty of uh, uh, coal fired uh, power plants and uh, it's uh, having a lifetime of, uh, of of several decades. Peter may tell more about uh, about that, but. Uh, that's uh, they haven't been closing uh, coal-fired power plants, and, and it, which are most of them are brand new, and, and uh, therefore it's a good question whether whether we would be able to turn this emission growth to rapid uh, drop in the coming five years to reach this 1.5 degree. We have uh, the, the IPCC report was showing that we have both economic and technological means to to, to reach it, but uh, but. Uh, it's a question of, of, of the investment, uh, and for, for at the moment, it's very attractive to invest in renewable energy, uh, to, to solar and, uh, and wind energy, and that's happening also at a fairly large scale in USA, where, where the public image is uh, something different. But uh, that's and, and also here in in no, no, northern Europe, it's attractive to invest in in, in wind uh, wind energy. But how quickly we will see that kind of conversion? That's going to be one of the one of the key matters here. Uh, I have a two-step question. The first is, currently we are, we are in a global average 1.1 degree world and we see major glaciers, uh, Greenland are melting and it accelerates. So from that point of view, a 1.5 degree world is already not so convenient, I would assume. And my question is when the first of these major coastal cities have to be, how to say, removed? It's only a question in time. That is my first question. And the second question is, uh, Hans Josef Fell, you showed a picture of him. He's a very close friend of mine. We collaborate in energy scenarios. And very soon we will publish a 1.5 degree Celsius scenario, which is, has the same cost as the current energy system without high risk technology. No negative emissions, no CCS, no nuclear. You can do it with renewables. And the reason is that in most IPC scenarios, the cost of renewables are still too high because they're already a few years old. Uh, so my question will be if we would have a kind just maybe discussing in science first, maybe in policy later, a 1.0 degree target on what uh, cumulative greenhouse gas uh, emissions in gigatons we are talking, we have to take from now out of the atmosphere to rebalance at 1.0. That's my second question. Yeah, so so this negative trend in, in climate will anyhow continue for the coming 50 years. So if we are extremely successful in, 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 in implementation of Paris Agreement, we could see a plateau in 2060s. And, and, and by then we see this uh, negative trend to continue with growing amount of uh, economic losses and, and growing amount of uh, disasters. And, and the sea level rise is expected to, uh, to, to persist until, until next century. So it's, it's likely to see up, up to one meter sea level rise uh, anyhow because that doesn't stop uh, immediately. And, and, uh, and, and then it's a question, coming back to his uh, answer to the previous question, whether it's realistic to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And, uh, and um, I'm a little bit skeptical whether that would take place. And uh, this 1.5 degree would be a major achievement and, and, and also two degrees would be a major achievement. But in the two degree uh, warmed uh, world, we would see already quite a bit of uh, more negative impacts and, 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 and the lower the numbers are going to be, the more economically feasible it's going to be and, 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 uh, and we should do our utmost, but uh, at the same time we have to be also realistic. But that that would mean that we would close all refunctioning uh, power plants, and, and and that's not very attractive for 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 many countries like uh, China or India. 
and 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 also I have have had a chance to visit several countries, also several developing countries recently. And um, and and once you go to a poor country, they are driving with uh, thirty to forty year old cars, and and it's also a question whether we, we are able to convert our, uh, uh, our our transport system to be carbon free and, and what to do with the old vehicles. Are they sent to African countries where they will still use them for, for, for several decades or, or, the, or are we going to buy them new Teslas that start driving? So that's that kind of real, real issues we are going to going to face. Uh, uh, and of course, it, it's, it's great to have, have such targets in mind, but uh, but how realistic is it, it is going to be? That's a different story. Peter. Yes, I would come back to the question of the permafrost and this kind of feedback mechanism. So if you would broaden up the, the question also to the ocean uh, temperature increase uh, and release of CO2 when the temperature increase, is there any kind of tipping point in, in sight? Are the climate tips? Uh, and, and if there is, uh, what would be the new equilibrium? Do we know anything about where the climate go to if it tips for some reason? So we have of course some uh, estimates from the history what, what, what has happened when we have reached certain carbon dioxide levels and, and there has even even been this uh, 2000 ppm of uh, carbon dioxide uh, several tens of millions uh, years ago and uh, and th then the temperatures were, uh, were, were considerably higher and I was showing this three degree uh, scenario with uh, with the current uh, current current uh, level of, uh, of of carbon dioxide. So we have such uh, examples from the history, and 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 uh, and it's a little bit a risky business. It's an experiment going on. What's going to happen finally? And um, and and there may be some surprises. And and th there have been some articles showing what are the what are the risky areas, and this methane release is one of them. Mm, uh, 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 drying of the Amazonian rainforest area is one of those. Uh, what's going to happen to the ocean currents and 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 also this methane release from the permafrost uh, areas. And, and there are several such uh, such things to be, to be to be followed. But we don't have uh, clear evidence uh, what's what's going to happen in in real terms. So that's uh, we have a list of uh, risk factors, but uh, but uh, but uh, the evidence is. Uh, not 100% sure that they are going to be materialized. But these kind of uh, stories that uh, the, the world would uh, go to a totally different uh, stage of uh, equilibrium, that's, uh, we, we have the model, model system which we are using for estimating what, what may happen in the future. And uh, there are also some unlikely with uh, low probability uh, cases that can, can, can be studied, but, uh, but this uh, this mainstream was, uh, I was showing one of the mainstreams in this uh, 500 years uh, scenario that was my second last. Uh, we, had, it, we just read in Nature uh, a few days ago that, that one of the very, very, very important, uh, I'd say, well, you know, scientists uh, actually stated that, that this kind of tipping point or change uh, may jeopardize the existence of life. But would that be possible? I mean, if we go really to the birth case, I, really I don't, I don't quite believe in that. So I, I see that the future will be a little bit grayer than today, but uh, but uh, there's not the risk that the mankind would disappear. That uh, I don't see that <laughs> as, a, as a realistic scenario. Some Thank some you. people are talking about uh, that, but uh, the living conditions in Africa, for example, they're going to be quite uh, quite harsh. And if they have, uh, uh, have had a chance to discuss with several heads of state in African countries, and, and they are already suffering because they are not able to provide uh, health care or education or employment for the young people. And if you have, uh, if you triple or quadruple the amount of population there with the poorer climate conditions, that's, that's going to be a mess. Salonis, I'm, I'm asking about that it seems that we know what we should do. Am I right? Yes. But there is no money. Then I have not heard a word, not here, I mean, but nowhere else, that how to finance this, because we are all uh, at the same uh, idea that now it's much cheaper to do that than in the future. But in every case, we don't seem to find financiers for 
solving the problem. Uh, can't, countries are too small, AU is too small. What about the banking sector or the financing sector? Yeah, so, so there, there has to be a win-win for the investors and, 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 and this problem will be solved uh, with the private uh, financing or not. So with the public sector financing, we cannot solve the problem. It, it can be some sort of catalyst or stimula stimulus to a certain direction, but, uh, but the major financing has to come from private sector. And, and, and as I said, uh, it, at the moment, it's uh, attractive to invest in, in solar and wind, uh, wind energy. It's not very attractive to invest in nuclear energy because the safety, safety regulations are such that it's, uh, for example, in Finland, it's, uh, it's not very attractive to, to do it. But it, in, even in Finland, it's attractive to invest in, in, in wind energy. But then it's again a question uh, whether we are going to get rid of uh, some of the already existing uh, power plants and so forth. That's that's going to be one of the one of the main m m main questions. And, and the message from the recent IPCC report was that we have uh, both the technological and economic means to solve this problem, but uh, but then uh, it has to be has to be made attractive. And, and for the investors, they also want to see stable in politically stable environment. And that's sometimes a problem that one government says that uh, please invest in nuclear energy and the next one says please ban nuclear energy and, and, and so forth. So, so this political system is also part of the problem at the moment. Other questions to Petteri? Hmm? Short one. That's a short question, is, is that most of the emissions in the future will come, come from Asia, not, not from the OECD countries. So. Uh, the, the local kind of uh, climate conditions change, but the local air, you mentioned the nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, very important. Would that be a driving force, the kind of local air quality, which may drive a positive uh, development in Asia? Not the CO2, but the local emissions, which are linked, of course, with the CO2 production as well. So personally, I believe in these kind of win-wins. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and for example, when European Union signed uh, science agreements with both India and China. I was part of the European Union delegation and uh, then we were using very much uh, this air quality as an at attraction for them to, to mitigate the climate change. And, uh, and for, for example, once you go to electric vehicles or these renewable energy sources or nuclear energy, those would be th that kind of win-wins. And, and, and best win-wins are, are such that you, you gain economically and uh, and you gain also health-wise and, uh, and also environment-wise. So that's, uh, those are the key, key issues for the, for the solutions. Now the uh, IPCC uh, made the first massive breakthrough what concerns science advice to the public and to the policymakers. But now, of course, we know that not all policymakers or political decision makers uh, are receptive to science advice. So do you have anything to say about this? Uh, do we have a brighter future? What concerns policymakers really uh, taking into account uh, scientific evidence and other evidence of important issues? I, I regard IPCC as a, as a science communication success story. Mm -hmm. We were just celebrating the 30th anniversary of IPCC, but it took uh, 30 years uh, or, or 25 years before Paris Agreement was signed. So it was, it was a long, long path. When I studied meteorology in the early, early 80s, we knew about this problem. And, mm -hmm. and WMO established uh, IPCC in 79, and uh, the first uh, report was published in 88. And, 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 uh, and it was quite frustrating for the science community to, to repeat more or less the same message uh, report by report. And, uh, and now this 1.5 degree report has been quite well understood and, and received by uh, even worldwide. And, uh, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons behind that is that uh, we have started seeing the impacts of climate change. So that was also this acidification problem that we talked about um, in, in the past. That, uh, we started seeing this as acid lakes here in the in northern Europe and so forth, so, and, and and also the ozone uh, ozone problem was solved because we saw that there's a risk for increased UV radiation, and and, and it was this was agreed uh, fairly soon. But when it comes to climate change, uh, it's it's something which happens very slowly. So so these impacts uh, were not seen in the 80s or, or 70s when IPCC was uh, 
was established. So these impacts have been the key driver of, uh, of, of, of besides the science, uh, science message. Then we have, uh, of course, uh, both companies and uh, countries who are dependent on, on fossil, fossil businesses. And, and uh, for them, it's not very attractive to go to these new, new sources of energy. And uh, that's also happening in some countries and uh, some, mm. and some heads of state, uh, states mind. But they are nowadays a minority. And e even in USA, where the public image is uh, fairly poor, they have already uh, implemented half of their, their Paris pledges. And there are several states and several cities who are proceeding and, and, and also it's attractive to invest in renewable energy. So things, positive things are happening mm. also there. The, the most recent uh, challenge is, is Brazil. So what's going to happen with the, with the new the government of, uh, of Brazil? Yes. Uh, now I suggest uh, we, we thank the marvelous speakers and, and the audience. And thereafter, I have a little announcement for you to make. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, to those who don't know this, but uh, Finland, the state of Finland, together with academic institutions and high-tech industry, established 13 years ago the world's now most significant innovation prize, which is called the Millennium Technology Prize. The patron is the, the uh, president of the Republic of Finland, and the next prize is going to be de delivered in May 2020. Now, uh, so far, nine awardees. We have nine awardees who have changed the world. This is uh, the prize is for radical innovation, which supports sustainable development and the well-being of, of mankind and societies. Uh, the nine awardees are absolutely fantastic. I don't have time to go into the details, but let me mention that three of them have gotten the Nobel Prize after the Millennium Technology Prize, just highlighting the uh, essential link between frontier research and, and radical innovations. So I would like to uh, mention to you that not now recently we have added to the technology areas that, that uh, are eligible environmental technologies, and we hope that we will get a lot of excellent nominations from around the globe in this area as well and, and, and just uh, for you to know I will distribute electronically the call for nominations uh, for you to consider nominations organizations can nominate and now I have the last question to you Juha how on earth do you uh, do you <laughs> keep this fantastic piece of art alive is it alive yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, thank you. It's 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 alive. I'm I'm not the expert. I'm not keeping it alive, but uh, I hope it's a it's a kind of sign of our wish to keep the world alive and green. It's an inspiration. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Also, you have for hosting us here. Thank you. I have to once more say that it's been very, very, very impressive and uh, we are all very pri privileged. And uh, thank you for the professors Christian Körner and Peter Talas. Thank you for Maria Makarov for moderating this. It's been quite a, quite a pleasure and, and uh, enjoyable experience tonight. Uh, as promised in the beginning, we deserve well our glasses of uh, Swiss wines uh, sponsored by the Swiss Embassy. So please uh, enjoy and uh, continue the, the discussions. Thank you.